Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 26th meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2017. Can I ask everyone in the room to ensure your mobile phones are switched to silent? Um, it is, of course, acceptable to use mobile phones for social media, but don't record or photograph proceedings. First item on our agenda is our uh, first evidence session on NHS clinical governance. Can I welcome to the committee uh, Rachel Lalone, uh, Lanone, uh, Policy Officer, Down Syndrome Scotland, Claire Ogden, Head of Communications and Policy, uh, action for ME, Carolyn Lockhead, Public Affairs Manager, Sam H, and Derek Young, Senior Policy Office, Officer, Edge Scotland. And we have apologies from uh, Tanith Miller, uh, the Campaigns Manager of Parkinson's UK. Uh, we'll just move direct to questions. We've got approximately an hour for our session this morning. Um, and uh, Colin, Colin, were you going to begin? Yeah. Do that, convener, yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much, Kavina, and good morning to the, the panel. Thanks very much for coming along to give us evidence. Uh, can I start with a, a question about the implementation of standards and, and, and the issue about variations in care? There, there's obviously a, a plethora of, of clinical standards and guidelines in existence, um, but some of the written evidence that the committee has received raise concerns about how well that those standards and, and guidance are actually being implemented. In your exp experience, do you think that health professionals demonstrate adequate knowledge of the relevant standards, and do you think that patients generally receive the treatment, the guidelines, and standards set out that they should? Yes, Carol. I think, um, speaking about mental health in particular, we find that um, the standards themselves and the guidelines themselves, where they exist, are generally good, um, but we don't find that there is widespread or, or consistent understanding of them or, or knowledge of them. We did some work a few years ago now with GPs, and we asked particularly about the sign guidance on non-pharmaceutical treatment for depression. And around half were not aware of it or weren't sure if they were aware of it. And we hear that um, reflected in the experience of the people that we work with. So for this particular um, piece of evidence, we did a survey of over 300 people. And um, what they talked about was a sense of um, not feeling clear what they were entitled to not feeling clear about the systems that were supposed to be in place to protect them and, and um, often of waiting a long time to receive access to treatment. So I would say that we, we don't feel like there is widespread awareness and understanding of them, although the, the guidance itself tends to be good, we think. Um, I would echo what Carolyn said. So the Scottish Good Practice Statement on ME was published in 2010. And when we surveyed GPs four years later, um, two thirds of them said they weren't even aware of it. Um, and of those that um, did use it, um, they thought it was good, but um, you know, to not even be aware of it three years after it's four years after it's published, um, and that's reflected in the patient experience as well. A lot of them are saying that their GPs, GPs in particular, don't understand ME and are giving them bad advice that is that is not helping them. Yeah. Um, the, the evidence I'm going to talk about today is basically based on a report published earlier this year. It was basically 400 of our members replying to a survey we did on healthcare, and that included 200 members with Down syndrome. Uh, the point about the standards, I guess the issue for us is around the screening, the preg pregnancy screening standards, and I think that's the point I raised in our submission. Um, they, they're there, there's guidelines, and although they need to be, I think, updated, which is happening just now, the fact is they're not being met all the time. And in the cases of expectant parents and new parents um, who welcome a baby with Down syndrome, there's actually appalling care in some cases. Um, and the issue, I think, between you know what's on paper and the implementation on the ground. So I would agree with the others that standards might exist, but when it comes to applying them, there's serious issues that need to be considered. Yeah. Uh, thank you, convener. Yes, I would echo very similar themes to the previous witnesses. Uh, we, I think we're actually getting quite good at writing standards now. We're drawing upon. Uh, previous evidence and previous iterations of the same standards in many instances. Uh, we've had an opportunity to be involved in the consultations around the new standards of care for older people in hospital, which uh, were published in July 2015. And then also the new overarching national health and care standards, which were published this year. Um, but in the case of the former, it's still the case now, a couple of years on, that these are not still forming the, the basis for inspections of older people's 
uh, hospital services in many instances. So with that, we don't have um, direct evidence that we can point to of health professionals' understanding of the new hospital standards. But if they aren't being used as the basis for inspections, I think it would be reasonable to assume that, that they are not a central part of the decision-making processes and the culture which exists within hospitals about those standards and how they are implemented. And it's, it's still true that through our National Telephone Helpline, uh, we receive calls from older people themselves, from their families, about incidences where they feel, firstly, that they haven't had the sort of care that they would hope for, but also that they do not know what the standards are and how they would go about trying to resolve grievances or raise concerns about how uh, the care they've received could be improved upon. So, so you guys can obviously run campaigns to raise awareness. And I'm just reading that the Parkinson's um, submission, they highlight the fact that someone with Parkinson's needs to have their medication on time, but they're constantly having to run a campaign on get it on time to raise awareness amongst uh, amongst professionals that, that that needs to happen. It's a constant battle for them. So you guys can run campaigns, but what do you think needs to happen in the NHS to make sure these standards are being properly implemented? Yeah. I think if I, if I go back to the pregnancy screening standards, um, we've been invited to the group currently looking at uh, reviewing the standards. And one of the issues that I'm struggling to come to terms with is that the standards are being issued by Health Improvement Scotland, but as far as I understand, Health Improvement Scotland doesn't have any power in terms of monitoring or implementing the standards, so it's up to each health board to basically decide on how they do that. And I would say there's an issue around accountability here and you know who is, who is then checking uh, what's happening in each health board. See, in terms, sorry, just to add to this, in terms of the standards across so many different conditions, how, does anyone know have a handle on how many different publications of standards there are? I mean, certainly in mental health, you have NICE and you have SIGN guidelines, and there are certainly more in NICE than there are in SIGN for mental health. Um, I wouldn't say in mental health that there are so many that it would be unreasonable to expect people to have a sense of them, particularly when it would be quite unlikely, again talking about mental health specifically, that you would actually need to know about all of them. You know, a lot of them are quite condition specific. So I, my sense is that it's not an overwhelming number. And is there commonality in, in, uh, across the piece in some of the basic standards that should apply? Uh, it's a good question. I would say, I would say broadly, yes. I mean, certainly, I've never come across anything in a standard that I felt contradicted something elsewhere. Yeah, Derek. Um, well, in response to your question, Kavina, there are certainly several that we know of. I couldn't give you a, a definitive figure, but we'd certainly be prepared to follow up in writing how many standards we're aware of and that older people routinely uh, confront in, in hospital settings. Um, certainly, there are condition-specific ones, as Carolyn mentioned, things like the dementia ones are obvious, but then also ones about processes that aren't condition-specific, such as the food, fluid and nutritional standards as well. Um, in response to Colin Smith's question, about what needs to happen within the NHS. Um, we made reference in our written submission to the um, examples of where things have gone very badly wrong. Actually, both of those examples are from England, but they remain pertinent, which are, are the Mid-Staffordshire NHS uh, Foundation and then also the Winterbourne View. Um, and following Mid-Staffordshire, there was the Francis Report, and that identified you know, several hundred recommendations, but in broad terms, <coughs> where a NHS trust, in that case, was focusing on processes and on finance rather than quality of care and patient-centeredness. That was the critical factor in ensuring that there wasn't the culture of quality and supported by leadership in order to create that effective change. Because written standards on their own, unless they imbue differences of approach and different behaviours and decisions that are made every day, uh, then they really don't have the value that we'd be looking for. Claire? 
Um, Ian asked a question about the number of standards. There is a single NICE guideline for ME, and there's also the Scottish Good Practice Statement, like I mentioned. But what we do find is that there's lots of recommendations that are made that don't make it into being a standard. So in 2002, there was a short-life working group on ME. In 2007, there was a cross-party group report um, that identified areas for action. There was a healthcare needs assessment in 2010. And there's lots of elements from all of those pieces of work that still haven't been uh, put into practice. Colin, are you finished? Uh, I, I suppose the one final point I was going to ask is that, 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 that all your organisations got a wealth of knowledge on, on the area, uh, and, and you'll be involved in the, the, the publications of guidelines, you'll be involved in that process, I think. Um, but are you involved in any work on the implementations of the guidelines? Do the NHS come to you about about checking to see whether things are being properly uh, uh, implemented, or is that something you just, you, you basically, you've just got to flag up where you see problems, like De Derek did there, for example? There hasn't been any kind of concerted effort to make sure that the professionals that need those guidelines are are working with them. Um, the survey that we did of GPs, even those um, that were aware of the Scottish Good Practice Statement, nearly half of them didn't use it. So they know it's there, but they're not using it. So there's something, you know, we need to find out why that is. Okay. Uh, Brian. Uh, thank you, Gavina. Good morning, panel. I'm, I'm interested in the, the, the role of uh, Health Improvement Scotland and uh, they seem to be the main regulatory body within uh, the NHS. And with that in mind, do you think they are um, sufficiently independent of the NHS uh, and indeed the Scottish Government? And do they have the powers adequate enough to uh, ensure necessary improvements taken and actually to enforce uh, uh, guidelines are adhered to? Yeah, Bridget. Um, well, that's the point I was making earlier. I think I, I can only talk about that because I... I've got limited knowledge otherwise, uh, but in, in terms of the, yeah, the screening standards, as far as I understand, they are publishing them and you know, working on them, but then when it comes to monitoring or implementation, uh, as far as I understand, yeah, they don't, they can't do anything, or they don't, they're not being asked to monitor or okay. when it comes to implementation. So uh, yeah, I found that quite um, troubling. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you, um, It is a difficult balance to strike, I think, in many public service contexts about how independent or how connected you would like your scrutiny body to be. Because, and I think there's a parallel here, not just with Healthcare Improvement Scotland, but also the Care Inspectorate. Uh, obviously, because of integration, these organisations are now working uh, quite closely together. Um, in recent times, the Care Inspectorate, for example, has decided to move from being an out-and-out -out scrutiny body to be one that is also focused equally as much, if not more so, on um, driving improvement uh, and supporting improvement. Um, and you can see, to some extent, that's, that, that trend is also uh, emerging within Healthcare Improvement Scotland as well. In terms of our direct experience with Healthcare Improvement Scotland, I mentioned before the standards of care for older people in hospital. We were uh, pleased to be able to be part of the project team that helped put that together. I think the only other third sector body that was involved in that was Alzheimer Scotland. Most of the other people in the room were themselves people from within the NHS. They were senior doctors, senior uh, nurses, um, ins inspectors themselves. Um, we, we, we did not have criticisms about the process. We felt that there was an opportunity, certainly because we were in the room, that was an advantage for us. Not every other organisation had that opportunity. Um, but an opportunity to take part in a discussion bringing some degree of outside expertise to the process of writing the standards. However, we aren't involved in uh, inspections themselves, which are the main route through which his can see and can advise the territorial health boards to what extent the standards that have been laid down are actually being implemented in practice. Um, there are uh, other organisations like the Health Council, for example, the Patient Advisory Support Service, who will have more detailed information about how complaints are processed and how recommendations are taken forward. Um, but I think we, we haven't found the independence issue to be a problem in our experience. We just want to ensure that the recommendations when made are, are followed up on. Yep, sorry, Carolyn, yeah. Yeah, I, I, think, um, I think that's fair. I think in mental health it's slightly different in that we also have the Mental Welfare Commission um, as well as the Care Inspectorate, um, which inspects many services, including um, many of our own. 
And I would say the so I'm probably slightly more familiar with mental welfare commission reports, which we um, which we do find are robust um, and quite um, very well researched and, and put together. I, I don't have a sense of a, a problem with the independence um, of of those bodies. I think there are there are times when we've expressed views about particular processes. So, for example, there's been a recent change to how reviews of suicides um, that happen while someone is in contact with mental health services are reported um, in terms of less information now being sent from the health board to the health to health improvement scotland and we're we're um, we're looking to explore that a bit we'd like to understand it a bit more so there are areas where we want to make sure that um, the process is transparent and is robust but <clears throat> in response to your question i wouldn't highlight a particular concern about independence okay right yeah so just, just for clarity then, it's, it's not so much around the independence, it's around the enforcement of the guidelines and to the implementation of the guidelines. So in, in, that, in that respect, uh, have HIS, have they got the power to, to, to enforce or do we need, do we need more, um, um, a more independent regulatory body? As you said, the, the, guide, the guidelines are robust, but they're not being implemented. I'm just trying to tease out why that would be. Or who should be responsible for implementing? Yes, yeah. But currently, it sits at board level. Yeah, is that process adequate? I would say um, absolutely. It sits at board level. There's also a role for the professional colleges um, in upholding standards. In terms of health improvement, Scotland's particular powers. Um, I have to say, I'm not sure in terms of actually enforcing um, a clinical standard, and I think that is an issue worth exploring, is what the consequences are if a clinical standard is, is not met. Um, I, I don't know that I could be particularly clear on that. I'd say also, Kavina, we don't have a, a, an official organisational view, but we're absolutely willing to reflect on that and then submit further evidence to the committee if that would be helpful. Okay. Uh, Alison. Some of the most concerning aspects, uh, if I, I think um, the, the submission from yourselves, Rachel, were around issues for which there weren't even any standards yet. Um, you spoke about, uh, there's a case explaining a, a parent's experience at a vaccination appointment, um, and also concerns uh, a mother was faced with a developmental questionnaire and was constantly having to say, no, you know, no, my child hasn't reached that that stage yet. And these are obviously things that, for which there don't seem to be any standards or regulation, you know, and it is around that question of being treated with dignity and respect. Do you think that's something that we have to look at? Yes, from, from our point of view, I think it's a massive issue that is currently maybe not acknowledged enough and maybe not addressed. Uh, because in terms of, yeah, the lack of, care and support, the lack of dignity and respect, it comes down in many cases to poor communications and the use of language and the terminology used by professionals. So when a health visitor is referring to a Down's baby, it's actually very upsetting for, for parents, new parents. When someone is going in for surgery with their child, they're obviously already anxious about what's happening to the child. I don't think they should have to worry about you know challenging staff on top of it because the staff might be referring to their son or daughter as the dance child mm -hmm. so we believe yeah there should be something done um in terms of the use of language and terminology and and the power that words have and the fact that i'm afraid that not all staff are using the right language uh, when they're dealing with patients and there's a critical yeah lack of dignity and respect and it starts you know again very early on when parents going through the screening process, um, and it goes through, I think, all the way. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's an issue that is hugely important and should be looked at. Mm -hmm. um, there's a similar um, issue about being treated with dignity and respect for people with ME as well, and we outlined that in our submission. Only one in four felt that their healthcare professionals treated them with respect. And whilst there are issues around understanding of ME and um, GPs perhaps not feeling well equipped to, to manage the condition appropriately, um, to say to someone that you don't believe they're ill, 
is not acceptable regardless of what condition they are living with. It doesn't really matter what what condition that is. Um, it's not acceptable. Um, yeah, I think um, when we surveyed people um, for, for this particular response, while um, it is worth noting that the majority felt that staff were courteous and sensitive, um, and um, most people said they felt valued as an individual, so there is some positives there. And in the comments that people gave us, they, they did talk about having good experiences with staff. Um, I always think that's important to say. <clears throat> but 40% felt they had been treated disrespectfully um, at some point. And when we, when we look at the comments and when we talk to people more widely than, than just this particular survey, we find that is particularly the case when people are either finding that they have to really push to get treatment or to get a referral. Um, some people spoke about feeling like they had been laughed at when they asked for a psychological therapy and had comments made about the length of time they were likely to wait for that. Other people, and, and we do hear this quite frequently, if there was um, an instance of self-harm, or of attempting suicide were made to feel that they were wasting staff time, that this was not a serious issue, that they were being silly. Um, so, so that is a particular issue where we think there is an issue about, it's not just language, it's, it's attitude and actually understanding what the issues are. So although I, I do genuinely think it's important to highlight that people do report good experiences with staff who are respectful and, and are absolutely trying to do their best, I think there's a particular problem when we look at, um, at self-harm and suicide. Um, well, there were there were sort of two aspects I thought to Alison Johnson's question. Uh, we we don't have specific examples we can point to where there is a lack of standards, which was one of the points that you referred to. Mm -hmm. But on the broader theme of dignity and respect, which the other witnesses have touched on as well, um, this is a it's been a, a major issue that we have been trying to highlight for the last couple of years. It certainly appears in our written evidence. Uh, the evidence we get from our helpline is that people who've experienced NHS care, for them uh, being treated with dignity and respect is as important as the quality of care that they receive. But there's also a very different dynamic at play over those types of questions, um, because people are not uh, as qualified as medical professionals to understand the nature of their condition, their prognosis, what kind of treatments there are, what are the risk factors. In, in those elements, they are very reliant on the advice they get from health professionals. But they are much more uh, in charge of a sense of understanding how they have been made to feel by their health experience. So they should be regarded and treated as experts in that capacity. Um, it is certainly an advantage that I mentioned before recent changes to standards. Dignity and respect now feature specifically in the new hospital standards from 2015. But as I say, they're not yet forming the basis of enough inspections. Um, it's, it's certainly true that that is a step change for professionals to deal with during an inspection process, because previous standards have been much more functional in nature. They've talked about timings of when people are offered a comprehensive geriatric assessment, when your rehabilitation planning and your discharge planning start. They're, they're, they're much more about specific aspects of the healthcare process. And it's by its nature, it's, it's harder to inspect on how people feel that they have been treated rather than the bits and pieces of the system and how they work. <laughs> so there's a, there's a process of change that staff will have to go through to understand how they do that. We have recommended something called the Nolan Census Framework in our written evidence. This is developed by uh, Professor Mike Nolan in Sheffield. He's a uh, long-standing experienced professor of gerontological nursing. Um, and it, it really is a, a very useful toolkit. And we would like to see um, better understanding and knowledge of that within health systems. We are ourselves willing to try and promote that. But um, if there was better understanding of that, I think that would lead to what the other witnesses are referred to, actual culture change and changes in attitudes and decision making by staff within the NHS rather than relying on the standards which they may not fully understand how that impacts on their day-to-day -day work. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, can I just ask a further question? So it seems there are, there are standards that I think we need to see introduced when it comes to, to language and behaviour and how we treat people who have conditions that we perhaps don't fully understand yet because we haven't got the research background. Um, do you have any concerns about barriers with, within the complaints process? Is there anything that makes it particularly hard for people to access? Do you think sometimes people are simply put off complaining because their initial experience is, is just such a negative one? 
Um, yes, I think that's the case. I also think a lot of people are just struggling to cope with the condition itself and having to complain is a step too far. <coughs> um, <coughs> symptoms of ME you know, specifically are quite debilitating, including cognitive difficulties and physical limitations. So that may, if you've only got a limited amount of energy, using it on a complaint might not be the best thing that you need to do for yourself <coughs> or your family. So yeah, I think there are barriers to, to that. So there, there almost needs to be someone there to, to, to take that process forward for you? Yeah, absolutely. And particularly those who are severely affected, who uh, that's one in four people with ME. They can be house or bed bound. Sometimes they can't even be touched by a loved one. And those people are desperately in need of advocacy to access the services that they are entitled to. Mm -hmm. When we did our, the, our survey, um, almost 80% of people didn't know about the systems that were in place to, um, to detect and to deal with unacceptable care. So there's a barrier of people actually knowing that there is any kind of a system for making complaints. Um, so I think we need to think a lot about how we communicate that to people. But people did speak also about the fear of making a complaint in that you know, they would initially have to go to the, the people or the organisation that they'd had that bad experience with to raise that complaint. And there was a real sense of um, fear of, of just not having the, the ability, as you say, while dealing with you know, your illness, um, to take that on. Um, and, and there was a sense coming through in the comments um, that this was a particular issue for people experiencing mental health issues, um, where your, your strength really is depleted and, and you can be struggling just to get through a day, to, to then have to take on um, making a formal complaint as well um, was just too much. But, but I do think that initial barrier of, of not knowing about the system in the first place is a, a big one. I would say as well, because um, I, I agree, there's an issue around the lack of information. The fact that people might have had concerns that they raised in the past that were not taken seriously, so they just think, what's, what's the point in, in me complaining? But yeah, I think a crucial issue is the fact that patients might not be ready to face another challenge on top of everything else. It can be very upsetting to have to relieve you know, the situation that they would like to complain about. Um, so one of the points I'd like to make is that there's something to be said, as I think, for organisations like ours to be consulted, maybe, maybe, and be taken maybe a bit more seriously, um, because yes, you might have a complaint system in place, but the fact is, I think there's many people I, in, in our case. I think there's many members out there who have had bad experiences, but probably never complained about it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Derek. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just briefly, can you? Yes, we have um, experienced through our, our helpline uh, not just instances of people feel that they're dissuaded from complaining, but also people limit their own desire to complain uh, when approaching issues of the NHS. And I think that's partly because they perceive that the professionals working in the system are dedicated, they're skilled, they're, they're well-meaning, but they are facing system pressures. And so, that in a sense, people um, uh, don't want to feel they want to add to that burden that professionals are facing by uh, complaining on, on top of it. It's also true that there are different complaints processes for each of the territorial health boards, and then also for the State Hospital, for the Golden Jubilee Hospital, for NHS 24, and for the ambulance service. So it's, it's possible that if you've had a consistent difficulty over many different instances, you might have uh, difficulties with NHS 24, you might have difficulties with the ambulance service, and then difficulties with a particular health board. You wouldn't want to have to make three different complaints under different processes. And then if they did not lead to a resolution that you liked, to then have to take it to the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman as well in, in terms of escalation. So what we repeatedly hear is that people dislike having to tell their story again and again. And there may be something in the idea that we should look at the way that complaints are, are the structure and architecture of complaints handling is dealt with in the NHS. Um, that being said, I think it's also important to point out, as, as Carolyn has also said, the vast majority of people report good experiences with their health care. And there is another organisation, uh, it's a service run by through Citizens Advice Scotland called the Patient Advisory and Support Service. I don't know if that's come out in your previous evidence, but um, our helpline advisors do refer people to the Patient Advisory and Support Service because they are able to do some of the work of advising people throughout the course of a complaints process and then potentially a review by the SPSO as well. Having someone that you know who is consistent and you are sure and you can trust is on your side actually does notably improve people's mood 
particularly if they feel vulnerable, particularly if they're suffering with communication or cognitive difficulties, where they just feel that the system is much larger and more powerful than they are. Thank you. What, and what then should be done to improve the system when things go wrong? I mean, thankfully, it's, it's a low number of people compared to the vast number of people who, who get a good service, but what, should we, what kind of changes need made in order to make the system better? I don't know if that was directed to me, convener, Anybody? but I'll, I'll respond to the opportunity. Um, I, I, I think there must be some opportunity for greater consistency in, in complaints, or at least, if I could, not, not wishing to rewrite more standards for the sake of it, but standards about how complaints are, are dealt with, or, 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 or principles that are applied consistently by all of the boards. Um, what would also help is if there was greater understanding and awareness of what happens when complaints are made. Uh, because one of the prime motivators for people to pursue things and be dogged and persistent that you might have to be when pursuing a complaint is the sense that it will actually lead to real change. Maybe in your instance, but maybe also for others who um, come after you who are facing similar clinical issues. I, I agree, and I, I would think um, a really um, important area to focus on is making sure that people know they, they can make a complaint and how they can make a complaint, and as Derek says, what will happen when you make a complaint. So there's something about looking at somebody's whole journey and what are the opportunities, what are the touch points where they could be told about their rights, not just in making a complaint, but their rights more generally. Everyone with a mental health problem in Scotland has a right to advocacy. That's not well understood, that's not well known, and actually if that was well known, um, and perhaps if advocacy was better funded, that's a slightly different point, um, that would help with quite a number of these issues because advocacy can be a great way of either resolving an issue before it gets to the point where you have to make a complaint or of supporting someone through that complaints process. So for me, I think a fundamental issue is people need to know what their rights are. Do people know what advocacy is? Um, I don't know. I think if there's a, a lack of awareness of the right to advocacy, it probably follows that there's a lack of understanding of what it is. Any other comments on that? Um, yeah, I think I'd just like to make the point that complaints, whilst really valuable, and there should absolutely be a proper process in place for that, mustn't be the only time that patients' views and experiences are shared. They should be involved right from the beginning of service delivery in the planning stages and um, kind of leading what those services should look like, which will probably ultimately lead to less complaints. Do we need a standardised, dare I say centralised, um, complaint system that is just that is this the same across the board, or is it is it too simple to say that too simplistic to say that? Yeah, I I would agree that anything that is standardised is actually quite helpful. So that even for in our case, if you think about the, the family support service, we've got four officers so supporting families across Scotland. At uh, you know, 12 o'clock one day, they can be in one local authority, it would be one complaint system. At 3 o'clock, it's a different one, different process. So even in terms of the workforce and people having to actually advise the family, it can be very tricky if you need to remember you know, all the different systems. So one yeah, standardized uh, system might be good. But yeah, otherwise, I would just repeat the point I was making earlier that I think there's something to be said for organizations like ours and maybe the evidence we have through our family support service to be to be better used maybe so this may, maybe some work we can do as an organization but for the nhs as well maybe to consult with us um a bit more and ask us whether you know this service is working or not and maybe we'll have evidence that could that could help improve if you know because i just don't think that every family will complain all the time so just clarify between standardised, which would be a standard set of procedures within each health board and other bodies, centralised being something distinct, which is an independent centralised system, can just clarify the difference between them and what you said? Because you, you mentioned, uh, Ms. Lenone, a, a standardised procedure. Would you suggest a standardised procedure or a centralised procedure? I think I would mean the same procedure. Like so implemented by each body, but standardised and consistent. Yeah, just to make it easier. Yeah. Could I briefly um, suggest there may actually also be an intermediate um, route, which is that there was consistency and standardised processes, but there was a single initial 
place to which a complaint could be referred, which would then be directed towards the appropriate board to deal with. So an accessible portal such. A, a sort of one-stop shop type idea. That might be a, an alternative as well. So, Rachel, you said there about they should speak to your organisation more. Um, presumably, your organisation and the other organisations here don't sit back and wait to be spoken to. You, you speak up yourself and you lobby and you submit to consultations, you do all the other stuff. So I just wanted to be clear that you're not sitting back waiting to be spoken to. No, no. What I mean is that, uh, you know, we're still a, a small charity, I think, compared to others. And we can we can make written submissions, but I think it's important to, to recognise that smaller charities might also have some knowledge that could be useful. And... Yes, we can we can try and contact you know organisations, but it can be quite difficult sometimes to find out who is leading on what and who is responsible on what. And in terms of resources for us, it can be very time consuming as well to find out where to go to to be yeah. you know the, to have the most impact. Uh, so yeah, and I mean in the past twelve months, I think as far as we're concerned, there's been some change somehow. So we've been invited to take part in the review of the pregnancy screening, for example, which is a very big step for us. And I mean, today is the first time we give evidence to a committee in Parliament. So again, that's that's a significant step. So I just mean, yeah, maybe there should be a bit more interactions that, you know, with people within the NHS, maybe contacting us, because sometimes it can be difficult for us to figure out who who is the best person. And we're very pleased to see you. Thank you. Um, uh, Claire. Thank you, convener, and, and welcome to the, the panel. Thank you for spending the time to come along to see us this morning. Um, I wanted to pick up a little bit on what Claire Ogden was talking about, about patient and service user involvement in services and service development. So all of the NHS and IGIB written responses to the committee stated that service user involvement was a key goal um, but the responses from patient representatives somewhat differed to, to uh, their evidence. And a number of the submissions criticised the NHS's approach um, to involving people in development services. I think Action for ME said about 84% of patients had never been asked about their experience of service, um, compared to 5% who were always asked. And Age Scotland said that there was little evidence that involvement is routinely and systematically happening at the planning level. So how can patient involvement in service development be improved? Um, I think <clears throat> there needs to be a real understanding of what the patient needs are and how they might be involved um, at that level. And it sometimes comes down to accessibility. Um, People with ME are not going to be able to make frequent meetings in a place far away from their house that lasts for hours. Um, so just by improving ways that people can share their views and experiences in a way that works for them um, would really make a difference, I think. If I can follow that up. Um, I think there's two different aspects of, of that kind of involvement. So there's the kind of strategic level involvement. What kind of services do you need? What do you want to see? Certainly our survey showed that... Um, <clears throat> almost 80% of people had never been asked what kind of NHS mental health services they want to see. But then there's also the kind of more individual day-to-day -day, um, being involved in your own care. Um, and again, um, if we looked at a Mental Welfare Com Commission report from earlier this year on acute admissions wards, and they found that the out of four care plans um, were not sufficiently person-centred. So I think there's an issue there about actually individual care being based on an understanding of, of what... Um, people need and, and want and think and feel. And I, I think I, I would agree that we need to think about on that more strategic level, the actual mechanisms, how do we involve people? Often things are done online, we do surveys online ourselves, it, it's a good way of getting information, but we have to not rely on that um, solely. The people we work with often tell us they're not confident with technology, they're, they're, they wouldn't fill in an online survey, they, 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 would, um, they would want someone to go and speak to them or at least have the opportunity to give their opinion via perhaps a service they already use or some way in which they're not being asked to just sit down you know, in front of a computer or, as you say, go to a meeting miles away that will go on for hours without anyone there to support them. So we need to think about having a broad range of ways that people can, can feed in and making sure that it's not the same people all the time, that the process is actually accessible to people more broadly. But I would say that it's also um, 
just as important to make sure that, that the individual care that people get is focused on not just um, you know giving them something, doing something to them, that it's actually based on the input that they can bring um, and the, the um, their own particular experiences and, and, and what they want. The guidance makes clear that's what should happen, but the evidence suggests that it doesn't always happen. Yes, Can I very briefly echo uh, some of the themes that uh, Carolyn has pointed to? Um, I, I think it, it's predominantly the role of the Scottish Health Council to represent patients uh, in their interactions with the NHS. And there certainly was a, a programme in the last couple of years. I think it's called Stronger Voice. I'm not entirely sure if that's right. If it's not, I'll correct it later. Um, to try and uh, improve the channels by which patients can uh, reflect on their experience and, and help boards better understand that. Um, but equally, it's you're unlikely to get individual patients who want to get involved in decisions about planning of services beyond their own experience. That's where organisations like our own uh, start to get involved and where we contribute towards dis uh, discussions about standards and enforcement and so on. But it's at the individual level where people will really feel uh, the greatest impact, whether they've been personally involved in decisions about their own care. And I can understand from people with mental health challenges, that's that, that's a particularly sharp focus. It's equally true for people who have cognitive difficulties or communication difficulties, where it's perceived that it's more difficult to get people uh, involved in discussions and giving consent to treatment. Um, we are pleased that the standards which now exist place far more emphasis on that, but it's still a very tricky area and one that requires sort of a lot of... Um, uh, good professional judgment, sensitive treatment to be able to assess people's capacity. But at the same time, that comes under great pressure, the more pressure that uh, staff in, in hospital wards are under, for example. Um, and that's an, an ongoing area of in interest and issue for us. Jenny, you wanted in briefly on this? This is a supplementary, Callum. This is specifically um, with regard to, to your evidence. Um, NHS Fife, you'll know, is one of the, the five health boards across the country uh, who haven't yet met the CAMS waiting target. So in terms of that patient involvement, which Claire Hoy um, alluded to, we've heard previously uh, from vulnerable groups, so for example, young people falling through the gaps, particularly in terms of their mental health and their uh, care provision. Um, do you think there is a geographic inequality in terms of patient involvement? Um, are some areas better than others? I think certainly you mentioned the CAM stats and, yeah. and they show very clearly um, that there is geographic inequality in terms of how quickly people are treated. So we know that eight um, of the, um, the boards are currently meeting the CAM stats. So that there's, there's clear evidence there. It's, it's the same for psychological therapies. We have statistics that come out quarterly that show very varying levels of people um, being treated within those timescales. Obviously, we would argue that a waiting time is only one part of access mm -hmm. to a service. Actually, the quality of care that you get when you get seen and the outcome, which is rarely measured in any kind of meaningful strategic level, um, is equally as important. Um, looking more broadly, I mean, it would be hard to actually evidence um, a, a disparity of care where you don't have those kinds of very robust statistics. But mm -hmm. certainly we hear from people that they, they feel they wait um, longer than they expect to, longer than they feel is reasonable. Um, looking at the survey that we did, I mean, we had it's a smallish number, um, but we had quite broad representation from across the country. And I, I would struggle, to be honest, to pick out one particular area that, that it looked like people were having a worse time. Mm -hmm. What we hear is across the board that our, that our experiences of waiting too long, of having to push really hard to get a referral, to get treatment, um, and of, of feeling like, um, I suppose particularly, again, I, I couldn't break it down for you geographically, but something that came back quite often was people talking about um, seeing a locum when they weren't expecting to, starting a course of treatment with someone and then that person went on sick leave or mat leave or in, in some other reason wasn't there anymore. So there's a point about consistency of people, which in mental health is really important yeah. to build up that trust yeah. and rapport. Um, I, I suspect it probably is geographically disparate, but I would not be able to point you to a source of evidence to see, okay. you know, beyond those stats mm -hmm. that you, you mentioned. Thank you. Thanks, Convener, and um, thanks to the panel for, for their answer to, to, to my uh, question as well. But I suppose I, 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 I'm not really hearing what, what a remedy is. I'm hearing lots of barriers, lots of concerns about, you know, perhaps people's ability to to uh, drive service change or to input into service change. So how, how, do, how do we get that patient voice heard so that we are actually developing services which are patient-centred and are what actually the public want? 
think um, I would go back to we have to find methods of doing that um, that are accessible to people, so that are not based particularly on a nine to five working day where someone's sitting at a desk, that are based on actually what's what's um, realistic to people. But I also think we have to make it we have to find a way to convey to people that that input is valued. And, and I think um, people don't always feel that, that they feel that they are consulted um, or they're not consulted, but they don't quite see the impact of it. So I think something about making sure that where people have been consulted, that there is feedback, that they understand what happened as a result of that and, and what role their feedback and input played. I'm not sure that that always happens. And I think letting people know the result of their having taken part in and been listened to is really important. Well, um, I would just suggest that, uh, I mean, inspection at the moment takes account of how services delivered on, on the front line. Um, but there might be an opportunity for inspection to look more closely at how patient involvement and feedback happens at board level and how it is treated, and for that to become a significant element of the reporting or on inspections when they happen, rather than of individual hospitals, but of board performance. Um, because it's the, there's no doubt that the inspection regime provides in a dynamic which forces the boards to articulate and justify what actions they've taken. And if that were to apply on an equal or, or equivalent basis, towards management and leadership, which is a critical element of trying to drive performance improvement overall, then that might have um, some of the effect that you're looking for. Because it's not just the ability of people or the confidence of people to feel that they have an opportunity to put their views across, but also then what is done with those views once they are received. So we currently have a situation where on the integrated joint boards, there's a patient representative who sits at, at that board level, and we've heard as a committee evidence from some of, some of those representatives about the difficulties and challenges that they face in that role. So I guess I'd be interested to hear if, if you have had any examples of good or bad of, of how that role is developing in within the IGIB boards. Um, Derek, you mentioned the Scottish Health Council. Have, have any of the organisations here submitted any contribution to their review? They are undergoing a review at the moment of their role. Have you, do you have conversations with them about the patient voice and how the patient voice is heard and problems within the system, how that can be made better? Or do they come to you and ask your view? The main route through which we've had those discussions have been part of the standards reviews that I referred to. They were involved in um, the standards reviews for older people and then also the, the new national health and care standards as well. Um, because we don't offer um, support to people for their individual cases mm -hmm. through our helpline, uh, part of our role is just to help inform what people where their options are and then signpost them appropriately. Um, there's certainly it seems like there's more opportunity for us to get involved in that, and we'll certainly look at the review that you um, mentioned. But I also referred to the Patient Advisory and Support Service. Now, that's still located in the third sector. It's within Citizens Advice Bureau. But they, the feedback we've got from people who have used that is that that's very positive in terms of people pursuing their own um, complaints. But it's a, it's, a, it's a fair point about whether the systems-wide uh, involvement is working as effectively as it might be, and we'll certainly reflect on that. I mean, I would be surprised if, uh, for example, the main uh, uh, organisation for older people in Scotland and the main organisation for um, uh, mental health in Scotland are not speaking, and, and, or the Health Council are not speaking to them about what they should be doing in relation to this agenda. So I would certainly hope that that would happen. Well, we did also participate in the Stronger Voice um, exercise I referred to before. Um, but yeah, there's, there, as I say, there's opportunities for us to improve that, that level of engagement. Okay. Alex? A, a small corollary to the questioning from the convener just there. In terms of the Scottish Health Council, we met with Scottish Health Council last year and, and uh, invited them to a number of evidence sessions. Can the panel give us your view on uh, the relative independence of the SHC, their efficacy in representing patient voice, considering you know, when they consult on service redesign, 
they, they act on the advice of government officials as to whether something's a major service redesign or a minor service redesign, only consult on the major ones, even though patients may have a differing view as to whether that service redesign requires their input. There is a sufficient services to be redesigned for people with ME in Scotland. Good point. So it's very hard for us to, to answer that question. One of the three services is a single individual. And that's that's all there is in terms of specialist provision. Anyone else on that? I would just say because I've in answer to your question, Kavina, we you know, we've had limited direct involvement with okay. the Health Council. Fair enough. You know, it's hard hard to know. But on the face of it, that sounds as if it could be a, a real problem for people if they fall on the wrong side of that distinction. Um or, or for services yeah. which would be regarded as minor according to the official advice. Can I move the question then on to the issue of service redesign and the impact on the groups that you represent? Um it seems to me that obviously service redesign is naturally quality led, but with a rigorous application of a quality framework, there's sometimes a tension with uh, well, unintended consequences on, on communities, particularly as Jenny Ruth, I think, quite elegantly used the phrase of geographic inequality, that sometimes if we, by the very nature that we will require surgeons or specialists to carry out a certain number of procedures in order to retain their accreditation, that then leads to service redesign, particularly, I think, in um, procedures around hips, knees and eyes. But also we've seen in the, the cleft relocation from um, Edinburgh Royal to Glasgow, even though patient outcomes were better in ERI. Um, is it, are you aware of the impact on the groups that you represent of those that kind of migration of services towards the centre because of this stricture? I would say, I mean, any service redesign um, it can be it can be difficult, can be distressing. I think it is improved when <clears throat> there is clear communication and, and discussion. Um, it's much more difficult where people feel something is just happening to them and, and they don't know why or, or particularly what. I suppose in mental health, um, the, the policy direction of travel is the other direction, really. We've, we've seen for a number of years a commitment um, at government level to move from more hospital-based to community-based um, treatment, which is a direction of travel we support as long as it is properly resourced. Um, and, and that's what we need to see is some actual shifting of resource from the acute sector to, to the community centre. So, so I don't know that that applies quite so much for, for our sector. I would imagine not, not so much in the field of mental health. On that then, if I may, Kamina, um, in terms of that community resourcing for mental health, we know that one in four doctor's appointments will be because of an underlying mental health condition. Um, are you content <coughs> that the Scottish Government efforts to put link workers in um, surgeries will be sufficient to meet that demand, even though those link workers aren't necessarily trained as counsellors or can offer talking therapies? We're very supportive of the link worker movement, but I think we have to have an awareness of what it is and what it is not. Um, in some areas, link workers are specialists in mental health. In some areas, you have a generic link worker service, so they will um, discuss any area of health and their, their job is to be sufficiently rooted in the community to be able to direct you to an asset in the community for anything. So we, we think link workers are a really good initiative. We are very supportive of them. Indeed, we have um, a link worker service um, ourselves. Um, but I think we have to be, as with any service, we have to be aware of what it is and what it isn't and what its limitations are. Um, link workers can be really effective at giving people more time and more space to talk through their issues than a GP would be able to, at being able to, to go along with them a little bit more. So, for example, if there's a suggestion that um, physical activity would benefit them, they can facilitate an introduction to a local service. They may even be able to go along um, on the, the, the first appointment. So they can be really effective. Um, but in and of themselves, they are not sufficient as a, a mental health service. We need much more too. And is there a concern that the link workers might establish with the patient that a certain intervention is required, but that intervention just isn't available in their locality? Well, the job of a link worker generally is to know what is available yeah. in their locality and to refer to that. So I think that's largely unlikely to happen. Um, in fact, in some areas, they can drive improvement. We have a service which is not formally a link worker service, but it's similar in Inverclyde. And indeed, they have driven improvement. At, um, there's now college courses that are um, specifically designed for people with mental health problems. Those did not previously exist, and it's because a gap was identified. So there is also the potential for, for gaps to be identified and filled through the, the link worker um, activity. Okay. Thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. 
Miles. Uh, thank you, convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, I wanted to um, move the conversation, and thank you for your submissions um, for this morning, towards families of individual people who are trying to access care and how they're treated and, and actually how they're listened to or not. Um, we've taken evidence from a number of people who um, have, especially for younger people, when they've been trying to support them, have tried to raise complaints and have been pushed back and the culture around actually um, the family and supporting an individual. And so I just wondered in terms of your experience, how you've found people's families have been um, listened to or not? Yeah, in terms of the, the families, I think what came out in our report was the fact that, I mean, we come in no surprise, but a lot of parents describing themselves as fighters so from the moment your baby is born with Down syndrome, basically in many cases you have to fight for everything from you know, education, healthcare. And the point we're making is that it shouldn't be like that. You shouldn't have to fight and you know, or have the feeling that you're actually competing with professionals when it comes to healthcare. Uh, so that's one of the, the points we would be making. Uh, but it's also, yeah, it goes back to the point we were making at the beginning about the issue of lack of dignity and respect. Um, we heard from parents this, this, who are saying that their concerns are not being uh, listened to. Um, our family support service is also reporting, you know, about parents making a complaint and then those parents are being described as being difficult or emotional by, you know, healthcare professionals and I think that's, that's wrong as well. Um, so there's a lot around, yeah, the support for families and actually listening to them. And many of them will have good experience, but the fact is that a lot as well don't. And there's also an issue around the, I think, information, the provision of information. So what came out in our report, for example, was uh, the issues and the provision of annual health checks for adults with Down syndrome, for example, 50% of the carers of adults didn't know about the recommended health checks. So it's about providing that information at the right time to families so that they can make the choices and they, they think, you know, they want to make. A huge number of people with ME are cared for by family members. It's extremely difficult to get social care um, provision for yourself if you've got ME you have to be extremely severely affected and even then it's you know it's it's tough to get um the parents of children with ME I think uh, like Rachel said would describe themselves as fighters um in a recent survey and this was of families mostly in England but we've no reason to think it's not happening across the UK um one in five families of children with ME were being subject to child protection referrals and most of them don't go anywhere and the reason they're happening is because things that would normally be a red flag like not sending your child to school and not letting them see their friends they're really normal for ME but because people don't understand that then families are being are being threatened with child protection mm -hmm. refer referrals and that's extremely concerning that's putting a lot of pressure on people who are already under a great strain. I think just um, yeah a slightly different angle on that. Um, I've, I've talked to parents before of, of young people um, who were um, severely ill and, and suicidal, um, and they've spoken of their, their son or daughter being discharged into their care um, yeah. with very little support or, or even guidance provided on how to keep them safe. That's a terrifying experience for a parent, um, to feel that you have that responsibility and you don't feel that you have the support or the backing. Um, of course, they absolutely try and they want to do their best, but it's it's something that I've heard from more than one parent. Well, I was going to note that actually in our case, it's not mostly the parents of people receiving health treatment <laughs> who are uh, the family member concerned. It's very often the children. Uh, and actually, uh, it's, it's, a, it's anecdotal evidence, but it's a collection of anecdotal evidence that most of the calls to our helpline about health services are very often from the children of people who are um, in patients uh, in hospital um, and who are struggling to get information and then to be uh, have a, a productive interaction with hospital staff because obviously they have far less time to be able to engage with uh, hospital staff. On a related issue, I would think I would say there is also difficulties where an older patient is suffering communication or cognitive challenges because then it will be very often be the, 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 their child, even a grown-up adult, 
who is used to advocating and organising personal uh, things on their behalf. But their status as a next of kin only comes into play at certain points in a, in a, in a health process. If there's severe cognitive challenges, they may already have a power of attorney or be a, a, a welfare... Um, uh, sorry, welfare power of attorney, or have a guardianship order under the Alzheimer's Capacity Act. I, what we have found reported to us is that sometimes there's very poor understanding of those particular frameworks and how powers of attorney and guardianship orders operate. Sometimes that's to do with the fact that staff don't get a lot of time or support to be able to do training on adults with incapacity issues. Uh, a lot of people have learned it th basically through an e-learning module uh, and they're not provided with um, separate time as part of their working time to be able to complete that. So it's 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 done to be done and seen to be done, but there isn't a, a lot of evidence, certainly from what we get, that there's widespread understanding of how that would impact on day-to-day -day care, and that will then obviously impact on how those family members interact with the professionals. Can I just have sort of almost a yes-no um, answer? Do you therefore think there's maybe a culture of trying to discourage or limit complaints from families within the NHS, um, given what you said this morning? I don't have enough evidence to say that there is a culture of that, but there's certainly enough indications of it that that's, that's worrying for us. Yep. Anyone else want to comment on that? If you can't comment, it's fine. Yep. Okay. Ivan, final? Uh, thanks, convener, and thanks for having a long panel. Um, my question kind of neatly dovetails on um, Miles Briggs' last comment. How, what I was going to ask you about was process improvement, kind of separate from the complaints process, if you like. So if people have a bad experience, they'll go through a complaints process, but very often you'll get a situation where people, either because of the care they're experienced or what they've seen through the process, they'll say, if you did that, this would be better. If you did that, this would be better. And we get people saying this quite a lot round about, I don't want to make a complaint, but you could make an improvement here. By, why did he keep giving me medicines that I don't need and I end up throwing in the bin? Why, do, why is the food coming at the wrong time and all it's wasted? Why does X, Y, Z? And there's lots of lots of examples of that. I suppose I just wanted to get your reflection on, um, do you feel that the, the health services deals with that well? Or is there a culture that as soon as anybody says anything, they assume it becomes very defensive and it's all about how do we stop this person suing us and how do we get them into this process where we can kind of um, deal with it in, in that sense. Um, because a mature organisation looks for opportunities for improvement. Um, do you have a sense that the health service does that or, or is it too defensive in that regard? I would say we don't see much evidence of that. Um, I think people with ME really often don't feel hurt by the health professionals that they go and see. But it, there are some really fantastic health professionals out there, and I, I don't want to. I don't want you to think that you know I'm, I'm, I'm saying that there isn't. But I think because of the stigma that's still attached around the illness and a lack of understanding and awareness about its impact, not just in health but across really core cool services, then that adds to the culture of of those people not being listened to. I would say um, where there has been a very serious event, such as a suicide or an attempted suicide, yeah, we do hear from people that things start to feel very defensive. Um, in terms of what you were asking about, which I think is about more kind of ongoing feedback and, and perhaps more minor. It, it can be a whole range from minor to major. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't say that I hear much about people being defensive. Uh, what I would say is, and, and this is a personal view, I would say rather than, I, I don't feel I could point to a source of evidence, but I wonder if there are th the channels to ensure that that kind of quite informal feedback that's not fed through a process actually gets to where it needs to go. I, I think that might be where I would have a concern. Similarly, I don't have specific evidence that I can point to about to what extent there's a defensive reaction uh, amongst health boards. But I, if you, I wonder if you think about this in human terms. If there is this sort of low-level, uh, small, um, minor suggestions about improvement, if they are then acted upon and never forms a complaint, that actually might not be formally documented within the system. So the, the, the difficulty from the health professional's point of view is that it actually we're not evidencing success very well. And if that were true, and if that were documented and highlighted for the benefit of uh, staff, 
that might help shift some of the the attitudes that uh, that um, staff have towards the complaints process and whether it is seen as a real opportunity to highlight and drive service improvement rather than just have a sort of very external um, accountability focused process because where complaint system are dealt with in the terms of an opportunity rather than a, a, a difficulty or a challenge that is a real driver for service improvement and that's not just within health service that's seen in other areas of public service too yeah i would, I mean, I would just agree with the, the points made before i think it's about the process and how do you capture those stories if it's not you know if it's not a proper complaint uh, and one of my concern would be if we look at you know people with down syndrome a service might not see many people with Down syndrome. So if you have two people telling you, two adults telling you, I would like more time to speak to the doctor, for example, I mean, if it's two out of a thousand, would that, you know, be taken into account? Or would that just, you know, be, well, you know, it's just two people, so we might just stick to what we do. So I don't know, that's one of the questions I would have, I would imagine. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Sorry, we're out, out of time. Um, could I thank you very much uh, for coming along this morning? Much appreciated. And uh, the committee will now go into private session. Thank you. Thank you.